So Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. It's popular to be a peacemaker. I guess almost everybody from presidents to pop stars is a peace lover. And yet despite that, it seems to me that conflict is a constant reality of life. Whether it's husband and wife, parents and children, gangs, ethnic groups, nations. And what is peace anyway? How would you describe it? Often peace is seen as the absence of something, absence of war, absence of hostilities or anger or stress. Peace is more than just the absence of something nasty. We might think of peace as hoping that the bombing will stop, or the shouting will stop. But at best, this signals just the beginning of peace, in the same way that there's more to swimming than not drowning. greeting that is used by Jews, that they can seek to confer on one another, you may be familiar with the word in Hebrew, shalom. And that is often translated peace. But it's a wish for far more than just the absence of trouble. It's a prayer for all that makes life complete for overall well-being and wholeness. <clears throat> and if you want to have a definition of that word shalom, perhaps we can best find it in the, the blessing that is in the Old Testament book of Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. This is the greatest and richest kind of peace. And it has moral depth because it's linked with fairness and righteousness and justice. Blessed are the peacemakers. Secular pacifists love to quote these words of Jesus. They argue that this constitutes the real gospel. If only people practice them, the world would be renewed. And of course, in one sense, they are correct. The only thing is that true peace cannot come without a radical change of heart by the enabling of the Holy Spirit. The call of Christ demands a radical overhaul of the human personality. If you have a badly polluted stream, it's no good pouring millions of pounds into trying to clear, clean it up if the fountain or the source is actually the problem. And Jesus is both the peace maker and the peace giver. See, true peace and true forgiveness are costly treasures. And the Lord Jesus is the supreme peacemaker, the glorious Prince of Peace. We sang it in one of the songs earlier. Restoring right relationships between men and women and God. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that's in Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. At least four times in his resurrection appearances, even just as we have recorded, Jesus introduces himself with the words, do you know what it was? 
Then go ahead and add, peace be with you. Peace be with you. It sums up everything that has been gained for us by what he did for us on the cross. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul says. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What are the qualities then of a peacemaker? Well, it's not necessarily the kind of person who is easygoing and doesn't care what anyone else does as long as it doesn't affect him or her. Neither is the peacemaker someone who's always tolerant, not an appeaser, someone who just wants peace at any price. The peacemaker pursues more than the absence of conflict, but pursues wholeness and well-being. Peacemakers are not passive, they are peacemakers. They pursue peace. And perhaps we need to start with ourselves. Do we have inner peace? Even though we, we, we're Christians, do we perhaps sometimes have a, a sense of nagging self-criticism and feelings of worthlessness? Because we can be very unforgiving in a judges. The foundation stone of peacemaking is to be at peace with God yourself. Before you can be a real peacemaker, you must have a profound experience of this Shalom of God. And next there needs to be peace in your home. Probably a bit easier if you live on your own. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> but it's no good winning the Nobel Peace Prize if you're at war with your family or your neighbour. And then after that we're called to be peacemakers in our workplaces, in our communities, in the society that we hang out in, wherever that may be, the places that we go. And for all this, we need grace. Peacemaking is often a thankless task. We may be misunderstood. We may be sometimes identified with the enemy. It may mean standing in that kind of no man's land between two warring parties and risk being shot at by both sides. But a true maker is willing to risk misunderstanding and failure because he's, he or she is committed to pursuing Christ's peace. And what is the blessing that's conferred? They will be called sons of God. Now sonship in Jesus' day was about inheritance, blessing and privilege. So this applies to both male and female. Those who reconcile the estranged are doing something that is just like God. To be a true peacemaker is to do the very work that the Son of God began when he came to earth for the first time and which he will complete when he returns the second time. All who endeavour to promote the cause of peace are like him, sons of God, worthy to be called his sons and daughters. And as we engage in this activity, we bear his family likeness. The blessing of being a peacemaker is that in doing so, we are God-like. Son, the word son in Jewish thought, means partaker of the character of. 
And being a peacemaker means basically doing what God has been doing since the dawning of human history. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And then Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they, per they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So this final beatitude is expanded and it, it possibly includes having those attitudes described in the other seven as well. And that can lead to this final one which has been described as the unwanted blessing. When we read the wonderful attributes of a person described in the beatitudes, we might think such a person would be universally popular. Jesus says, woe to you when all men speak well of you. Woe to you. Jesus' beatitudes run counter to many of the values that shape our world today. So while some will be attracted by our faith, as we'll see as, as we carry on in the next few verses, others will oppose us some vehemently. Experience, we, we must understand it. Sometimes people just experience everyday troubles and they talk about it as persecution. They regard it that they're being persecuted. That's just part of the package of being human. That's not persecution. Nor are we being persecuted if we're being blamed for something that we have done wrong. You know, we do speak unkindly to, to people, even if we think we're doing so in God's name. Jesus said it was when people falsely say all kinds of things against you. And, and to be honest, sometimes Christians are persecuted not for their Christianity, but for their lack of it for their rudeness or insensitivity. They bring persecution on themselves by their own personalities. There are those who seem to aspire to being what somebody's called God's rottweiler. You know, delighting in mercilessly savaging anyone who doesn't agree with them. And a few people almost seem to want to be persecuted. You know, it's like having a persecution complex, we might say. As far as possible, we're called to live at peace with all people. That's what the Apostle Paul says, as far as it depends on you. But Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted. And he says, because of me, people say all kinds of evil against you because of me. That's the key. Persecution for our faith is only persecution when it's because of our commitment to Jesus and our identification with him. I'm not trying to class it as persecution, but on one occasion when I was doing a part-time job, um, or sorry, a temporary job, I should say, it was full-time, temporary, um, one of the co-workers with whom I'd got on fairly well, um, don't know how the conversation went that way, but he suddenly said to me, you're not one of those born-again Christians, are you? <laughs> and so I said, kind of, well, actually, yes, I am. <laughs> and from then on, his attitude just changed towards me. There wasn't anything I'd done. It was because of my identification with Jesus, or at least what he perceived Christianity to be from his parents, apparently. But it's only a persecution when it's because of our commitment and identification with Jesus. Jesus says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. 
If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Sometimes you might ask, well, why is this thing happening to me? Because I'm seeking to do the right thing. I'm seeking to be faithful to Jesus. Well, Jesus was a living, walking beatitude. And look what happened to him. If we've never been out of step with the prevailing culture, and we've never suffered its disapproval because we follow Christ's truth and his ways, perhaps we should have some really serious questions about <coughs> what our Christianity really is. Persecution is a clash of two irreconcilable value systems. People don't like you <coughs> to be different. If you don't cheat on your taxes or laugh at coarse jokes. And so we may make great efforts to be meek and merciful and pure in heart and peacemaking. But someone who tries to live out righteousness is often going to provoke a reaction. Just as our, foreign, uh, as our, our bodies unleash defence mechanisms when a foreign object like a virus enters our bloodstream, so also the world reacts to the, the, the presence of an active and living Christianity. In fact, true righteousness, Jesus says it's persecution because of righteousness. True righteousness makes people feel underdressed. You know, as if you've been caught wearing jeans at a smart dinner party. When you don't really care much about righteousness, it's easy to convince yourself that you're not too bad a person, really. But when a person living genuinely righteously comes along, that belief becomes very difficult to retain. Being Christian means putting your ultimate allegiance with Christ, standing with him. And that causes enormous problems in organisations that require a strong allegiance. Take the ancient Roman Empire. As it was expanding, it needed to hold together a vast range of diverse peoples. It soon became clear that one of the simplest ways of keeping everybody united was to encourage universal commitment to the emperor. Eventually it became compulsory for every citizen once a year to make an offering to the empire and say, Caesar is Lord. Probably most Romans just shrugged their shoulders and burned some incense and repeated the words and went about their daily business, which may or may not have included worshipping whichever gods they felt like. But to Christians at the time, Jesus was Lord. And they couldn't compromise their faith like this. And so because the Roman Empire couldn't tolerate such acts of disloyalty, early Christians were soon brutally persecuted. Now, no matter how bad this sermon may be today, I'm probably not that likely to be put in prison for preaching it. But persecution for being a Christian is very real in many parts of the world. And we should pray for the persecuted church. One thing we can be sure of if we suffer because of our identification with Jesus is that God will not permit what has been done for his glory to go unrewarded. Paul writes to Timothy, I fought the good faith, I finished the race, 
I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. If you're having a tough time because you're a follower of Jesus, rejoice and be glad. You're blessed. You're approved by God. Because great is your reward in heaven. We don't see the full picture. We tend to only see the problems and not the future reward. Jesus endured the cross because of the joy that was before him. All these beatitudes reveal the values of the kingdom of heaven. They're expressions of spirit-produced kingdom life. Kingdom people seek different blessings, different benefits, and Jesus promises that they will know a deeper happiness and satisfaction than any, anyone else or anything else in this life can offer. And then he goes on to say this, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be trampled underfoot. To, to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp it under a bowl. Instead they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You're persecuted, you're blessed, but don't hide, Jesus is saying. Our calling is to be both light on the hill when we're gathered together as a church and to be salt scattered in the world, influence and illumination. We're not to withdraw from society as Christians, but to be involved. We're called to be involved and yet to be different. Just as salt is different from that around it and so is light. Before the days of refrigerators, Salt was used to preserve meat. It was used to stop meat going bad. And in a similar way, we're called to influence. We're called to, to, to be God's chosen agents to bring the world back into harmony with his plans. The former US president, Ronald Reagan, once said, governments do not solve problems they merely rearrange them. There's a lot of truth in that. The currency of influence in God's kingdom isn't power in the world. It's proximity to Jesus. God loves to use ordinary people to change the world. Those that Jesus spoke to when he was giving this sermon were the people who brought their sick and their lame and the deaf and so forth to him. Most of them were peasants, just ordinary people. Look at the bunch of disciples that he had. What a mixed bag that was. Jesus says, we are salt of the earth and light of the world. In the natural world, animals need one of two strategies to avoid being eaten. One is that you adopt a camouflage or change your habits so that predators don't notice you. <laughs> There's a danger that perhaps maybe we've become so much a part of the fabric of our world that instead of being distinctive, we're no longer distinguishable at all from it. Salt is a flavour enhancer. It brings out the taste of something. We all like different amounts of salt, um, depending on our taste. But maybe sometimes, instead of bringing out the flavour, 
and failed to emerge from the salt shaker altogether. We're called to be distinctive as followers of Jesus in our lives and our words. The other strategy that animals use to avoid being eaten is to acquire teeth and armour and make themselves unpalatable. And maybe the opposite happens some, with some of us. It might be that we spoil the taste of the loveliness of Christ because we download too much onto people, too often and too insensitively. I've, uh, you've probably been there. If you put too much salt on something, it's horrible. No, New Apps has, is, a, is a brilliant cook, and um, I, people always tell me how blessed I am to um, be married to her in, in that regard, for one thing. <laughs> but if there's ever been anything that's been cooked that I haven't liked, it's usually because too much salt went into it. <laughs> Accidentally, very rarely happens, actually. Maybe once or twice. And then I've not been very keen on having leftovers and things. Uh, Too much salt is not a good thing. It has to be the right amount. Jesus says also we are to allow his light to shine through us by our good deeds. We need God's heart to be downloaded into our hearts so that others may see in us humility and truthfulness and integrity, and reliability, and the avoidance of gossip, the desire to build up and encourage others, unselfishness, compassion, and kindness. One man said that when he came to, to know Jesus as a teenager, his dad said to him, I'm not interested, I don't want to know. 10 years later, to the very day, he sat his son down and said, you've been a Christian for 10 years. I think it's not a passing phase. I can see the difference it makes in your life. Tell me about it. And all that family became Christians. The light of Christ, not, not through what he said, but through his good, the, the change it had made in his life, his good deeds. Salt and light. That's what we're called to be. Most of us probably don't believe that about ourselves, to be honest. Others, yes, but not us. Perhaps we've been through a divorce. Perhaps our children are not where we'd like them to be. Maybe our marriage is not what it could be. Maybe we know our personality flaws and our failings all too well. Maybe we have problems in our work. Because of these and many other things I could mention, we might develop almost a psychology of inadequacy. And so we don't do anything, we don't say anything about our faith, because we don't believe we'll make a difference. There's a story about a servant who was responsible for going to get water for the king. Every morning, he would get two massive jars, put them on a stick, and walk down to the river. And one day, one of the jars said to him, could you kindly leave me at home this morning and get another jar? Well, the servant was bemused. Well, he always used the same two jars. And when he asked the jar why, the jar said, well, you know, I've been at this job for a long time now, and I've got some cracks. And every time you take me down to collect water. By the time I'm back, I'm half empty. I'm not good at collecting water anymore because I'm broken. And the servant said to him, no problem, because you see, I planted some seeds along the ground because I've realized that you've been leaking for many years now. <laughs> but I've planted those seeds in such a way that every time I walk Back, back from collecting water for the king, you're actually watering the seeds as you leak. And you see, the king very much appreciates you because while he loves to drink water, 
He also left the flowers that I'm able to put on his table that are there because of the leakiness of who you are and the watering of the seeds so that the king's table can be beautiful. <coughs> Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. In and of yourself, you may feel you have very little to offer. But Jesus chooses you as his change agent. To be salt and light, you don't have to be perfect. We, 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 we all have leaks. We all have inadequacies. We may have failures. But God in his grace and mercy takes hold of those failures and those inadequacies and he can cause us to water people along the way as we meet them. So you may feel you're just leaking and inadequate and other people are much better than you are. But if you come before God in meekness, with a hunger and a thirst for him, and dare to believe that in your brokenness and your inadequacy, God can use you to be salt and light, to bring influence and illumination to people's lives for God's glory. What a difference you could make, what a difference we could make in our world.